welcome to Tales of Leadership. It's been a long time coming, but I'm glad that we were actually able to make this recording happen. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. And uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah. So I think always a good place to start is just going through with the listeners and I, and letting them know who, who you are. Who Who is Paul Hill? You know, most people, if you were to ask me that, especially in the professional capacity, is uh, the answer you would get is, well, Paul Hill was a flight director in mission control, uh, or Paul Hill ran mission operations for mission control and space shuttle flights and international space station. I mean, that's what I'm really known for. Um, now, I spent spent a number of years in the Air Force in satellite operations before I came to NASA. Uh, and, you know, like most military uh, career fields, I showed up at NASA doing work that was similar to the things I did in the Air Force. And just four years active duty in the Air Force, I showed up and it felt like I was years ahead of some of my peers. You know, some of it is that extra push, I think, that you get from military service, you know, more responsibility at a much junior rank, much, much junior age, uh, as opposed to much of the rest of the world where it takes you much longer to get there. And that served me extremely well. And then I went from being a senior engineer, doing various engineering studies and getting ready to fly and build the International Space Station to becoming one of the first flight directors for actually operating the space station in orbit, um, conducting the assembly operations in orbit, if you will. Um, And then after a number of years of that, both managing space shuttle flight operations and International Space Station flight operations, I moved up into the senior management ranks. And after a couple of years, uh, became the director of mission operations, where I spent the rest of my NASA career effectively running mission planning, training, and flight execution or mission control itself for the operations. In wow. a nutshell. Yeah, that that is a rich history. And where I really want to start off with is because I've never had anyone from a NASA background on tells leadership. I've had military leaders who came on that kind of went into the entrepreneur space. I've had business owners, um, CEOs, but I've never had anyone kind of within that background define leadership in their own terms. And that's the beauty about the definition of leadership is it's specific what I'm learning to the individual. How would you define it? And then how how has it changed, especially since being in the Air Force and then transitioning into NASA and, and working in that side? You know, I'll tell you, when I showed up in mission control in 1990, so this is the same mission control, same engineering group, like you can like trace the generational handover all the way back to Apollo, Gemini, and Mercury. Mm-hmm. So you think about what those teams had accomplished. When I showed up, they had a very rich, very specific leadership culture. They were yeah. very focused on how do you run the team? How do you make basic decisions to be highly reliable error-free, be right every time because the Mm. cost of being wrong is is too high. And the the beauty for me then showing up from the Air Force is, you know, I'm my first week in in the office and listening to these people talk the way they just talked in the office and the things they thought were important. I thought, wow, I am home. These people speak my language. And so one of the things that became clear is there was a lot of leadership related talk value related talk a lot of posters on the wall where we advert were advertised at by the senior management and this is not Mm. necessarily nasa wide but mission control the people that that actually manage the flights and responsible for the astronauts lives while they're in, in orbit those areas inundated with values this is who we are if we make mistakes they have the ultimate consequences this is why we pay attention to detail this is why we're willing to speak up in the meetings or on console flying the spacecraft when it feels scary. This is why we overcome that and speak up anyway. So going back to your question, how I define it, for me, real leadership is all about preserving that focus, preserving that value that what we do, uh, the mission itself, protecting the assets, protecting our people, that matters more than anything else. That matters more than my discomfort. Um, so I'm willing to ask the hard question or I'm willing to ask the dumb question where I look around the room and everybody else appears to, to understand what's going on. And mm-hmm. I don't understand how we got to this answer. Having the courage to do that is one of those values. P- preserving a, a team environment where over time you learn that, you know, you don't have to have courage to do that. The boss not only will tolerate you saying, I don't know, 
He's expecting it if you don't know. In fact, what you are more likely to, to get glared at, if not run off the team for, is not knowing something and acting like you do. Hmm. Or shooting from the hip on an answer when you could have taken the time and looked up the data and, and been right and hmm. not projecting to the rest of the team that, oh, no, this is an answer you can you can hang your hat on. I know I'm right. So for me, leadership is all about running the team in such a way that those things become easier and easier. The way we learned to say it, by the time I was in the executive ranks, and actually to, to be really fully forthcoming, by the time I'm in the management ranks in mission control, which is 2007 timeframe, we talked a lot like this. But if you were to ask one of our most senior leaders, hey, can you just give me the top three principles, really codify what is most important to us? We couldn't do it. Yeah, we wow. understood the big picture. And a lot of the ways we would say it is, look, we recognize it when we see it, whether we're talking good performance by the individual or by a team or good leadership. We know it when we see it. We don't have to be able to say it. And what we learned was if we can't say it, we're not always going to do it because over some generations, you're going to forget. You're going to think you remember what we do and how we do it and why we do it. But you will have forgotten some things, which is exactly what happened to us. And so my generation, if you will, of senior leaders, I make it sound like, like I'm giving myself credit. I just happen to be the guy at the table with hmm. a number of the people that work for me. We started challenging ourselves on how do we say this? And, and we finally learned to say, it. in fact, that's kind of the, the, the crux of the book that I, I published a few years ago. And ultimately, it is making our decisions based on technical truth, having the integrity to know when we're guessing and when we actually know something versus, you know, data versus theory versus, well, you know, I think this is right. And knowing the difference and then having the courage to speak up. All of that sounds really easy. They are so difficult to do, and we learn them deliberately. When we bring new people into mission control, all of our training is really focused on learning how to behave in ways that demonstrate that over and over. And for me, the most important thing we can do as a leader is continue to reiterate, this is who we are. This is how we, we do business, whether we're flying or when we're getting ready to fly or after we fly. This is how we go back and scrutinize our performance and find out where we made mistakes, where even when we were good, where could we have been better? So we show up tomorrow and we're better. I love that definition of leadership. And I can already see a lot of similarities between how NASA does business, at least within your time, and then how the military does it. Um, so many things that you said that kind of just want to go back to, because I think they're all really, really important. The one is being right every time matters because the cost of being wrong is catastrophic. And it's the same within the realm of that I'm in is in the combat arms within the infantry, because if you're wrong, well, then that means one of the sons and daughters that wear the uniform may not be able to come home that night. So the decisions that we make bear such a heavy consequence that we don't make them not fully understanding what I like to call the common operating picture of like, what assets do I have? And how can I leverage them to not get rid of the risk, but to mitigate it down to a level where I feel comfortable with the decision that I'm making to move forward with. And another thing that you said um, that I love is and I've learned this being in acquisitions. Just because you don't know something and you ask that question does not mean that you're ignorant and in the eyes of your team. And it, I I would argue and how you would say it is that it actually breathes light into a team when a leader doesn't know something and they ask the question, even if you think it's stupid to ask internally, it just opens up a different layer of how people see you on your team It's like, all right, this, this gentleman here is curious and he's coachable and he's wanting to learn. And that is one of the things that I've learned, especially transitioning from the infantry into acquisitions is, is having that, Humility, I think, is probably the best way to define it. When you don't know something, ask a question so you can gather all those facts and you can make a better informed decision. And the last thing, I'm, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say the last thing, and and I love it because I had General Petraeus on, and every time that I hear someone talk about this, I see the same loop cycle of strategic leadership, of getting the big idea right, the culture within NASA. What is that? What is that culture? How can we communicate that culture? Because we have that tacit knowledge. When I see it, I know it. 
And then how do we live that knowledge? And then how do we adjust it to make sure that we got the big idea right? And then it's just an, a revolving door. So, so many great points, and we're only 10 minutes into the episode. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, one of the key things that's related to all of those. So, you know, you mentioned leadership, humility. Um, part of that, I mean, it's it's that willingness to ask why. I mean, of course, it's mm. it's the willingness to look like you don't know, right? Or, or, in fact, to admit that you don't know. And the best of us, I mean, the, the best, I mean, truly eye-watering rocket scientists I work for did not know everything. And sometimes, sometimes there was something they didn't know. Sometimes they made a mistake. The same thing was true of me, even when I was the executive responsible for all of it. In fact, that was what kept me awake the most was, holy cow, what if, what if people working for me either respect me too much or fear me so much that they won't question me and they won't stop oh, me wow. when I clearly made a mistake? Um, and the, the thing that's, that's all related to is that leader's willingness to also not just ask why, but demand that on every decision we make, every risk that we accept, every choice that we make and say a system design, or are we ready to execute this mission? We have to be able to answer the whys associated with why that's okay. And the reason that we can't ever accept is, well, this is the way we've always done it, so it must be okay. Mm. Or I'm in charge, and because I'm in charge, that's why we're going to do it this way. Well, that doesn't actually keep your people from getting killed. Where, whether you're you're talking about combat arms or throwing people into the sky, just because I'm in charge and I get to decide isn't the why. The why is related to what do we understand about the risk? What are the physics? What is the data? What is the test? What is our previous operational experience that tells us that's a good decision? Not just because we did it this way before and got away with it, but are we sure it's the right thing to do? Are we sure we're un we understand the risk? And, and in many professions, yours and mine both, but there's many others like this, you're never going to manage it in a way so that there's no risk. Yeah. What we want to do is actually understand the risk and take it deliberately and manage the risk to our best ability. Yeah. And you can't do that if you're not asking those whys. You're becoming a cowboy. And as you gain experience, so this is the problem for individual leaders. Actually, this, this is a problem for us at the working level. It's a problem for leaders. It's a problem for teams. As you gain experience and do harder things, you gain enough confidence that you stop being as careful because now you know you don't have to be because mm -hmm. now you're good. And that's when you start getting sloppy. You start losing that technical truth that I mentioned. You stop asking the whys because, hey, everybody knows I'm good. I don't make mistakes. Well, I might have been good. I, 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 might, I still might be really smart. But the way I made the decisions before might have actually lent – or leaned more on real data, real experts, real inputs, rather than just just my sense of, of my own goodness. And mm -hmm. you can look at failure after failure across industries, including but not only NASA's failures where we lost astronauts. And it's almost always this. It's not engineering oversights or technical mistakes. It's Things like this where, in fact, in the after actions, you go back and start doing the review and you hear people say, oh, yeah, we knew we were making a mistake there. We all knew we shouldn't have been doing that. And they didn't speak up and they went and took some risk that they weren't actually managing. Wow. Uh, and, you know, I'll tell you, the other thing is a lot of people that hear this discussion, they nod their heads when it applies to space flight or when it applies to combat arms or aviation, some parts of oil and gas, those areas where things can blow up and people can actually get killed and they can get killed right away. It's yeah. easy and obvious to see how these things apply. And where you start losing it is you start moving into other parts of even those same enterprises, like acquisitions, where mm -hmm. it's easy to say, look, you know, I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm managing a procurement over here. Maybe we go over a budget. What's the big deal? Until your hardware hits the floor. And now somebody's relying on it to, to, to save their lives. And yeah. it doesn't function, right? Because we skipped over something because we knew how good we were. And, and what I challenge audience after audience to think about is in wherever you sit in your profession, what's the price of failure? You know, it, could you get somebody killed if you make a mistake and somebody else eventually doesn't catch that mistake? Or do you just cost the company a lot of money? Do you put the company out of business? Um, you mm -hmm. know, do we run off all of our customers? Eventually, you know, the question is, can we afford whatever the ramifications of those mistakes are? If we can't, then we sit back and think, OK, then how do I preserve this willingness to ask the whys and make it OK? Make it a cultural 
demand, in fact, that the people that work for you will insist that as a leader, you ask and answer the whys and allow them to do the same thing. That is probably one of the best five minutes that I've had on this podcast of just you walking <laughs> through that. And I'm not even joking. And you brought me back to one of the the truest examples that I've had of um the status quo. This is the way we've always done it. And it was um, when we just got to Afghanistan. And I remember vividly sitting in our battalion talk and first mission of the uh, of our entire uh, nine month combat deployment, first mission, EOD goes out to respond to an, an IED. And EOD has their normal TTPs of doing their fives, 25s and 50 cordons and then being able to clear those improvised explosive devices, IEDs. Well, the Taliban realized what our TTPs were because we got complacent and we got cocky with how we were doing those things. And essentially what they did is they adapted. I, I won't go into to how they adapted and they adapted it so well that we weren't able to be caught up with it. And it ended up losing a soldier within the first 15 minutes of us being on ground. And that is one of the, in my mind always sticks to my um, six with me is the realist example of status quo. This is the way we've always done it. And we're always going to be able to do it this way. Well, the enemy is going to get a boat and it doesn't matter if it's an actual enemy shooting at you, or if it's just the operational environment that you're in or the world economics it's consistently and constantly changing. And that's such a powerful, powerful example. What, what I'd love to do, Paul, is, is to start off on your leadership journey. Where, where did that start for you? Was that right around the time that you were joining the Air Force? It was. I mean, I guess I, I would be not giving credit uh, where it's credit is due by the, you know, the four years I spent in the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M. Mm. Um, now, a fair amount of that I probably not say this right now. I'll get the core in trouble or get them mad at me. But you know, a fair <laughs> amount of that was hazing. That mostly I learned how tough I was and what I could put up with mm. um, without without punching somebody or or with. Um, but we definitely came. You definitely came out of that environment toughened up and able able to overcome a lot of pressures. Um, my first real real spark in the professional environment was. Uh, a major and then lieutenant colonel that I worked for only for two years um, in my four four years of active duty. And, um, and in fact, this guy, I was a deploying officer. He brought me into a staff position. I never saw him in our operational environment, but everything this guy did exuded professional excellence. I mean, I mean, we wore camis and, you know, I looked like a guy who wore camis and crawled around in the desert. In my staff position in the office, I looked like one of us that carried guns through the, through the desert. This guy mm. looked like he just bought the, the uniform and and had it pressed and was wearing spit shine combat boots. And every now and then he would joke with me about how I looked. And I was I was considered one of the up and coming. By then I, I was a captain and I was considered like to have my hair on fire and respected <laughs> amongst the ops community. So how I looked didn't matter at all. I was a badass, right? Little little bitty badass, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, and I asked him one day, and I knew this major and then Lieutenant Colonel, like I said, thought highly of me. I knew like I was kind of his guy. And I asked him one time, hey, so why do you put so much effort in, into what your uniform looks like when we are going to go back out in the field? He says, Paul, every time you walk down this hallway, the airmen are looking at you. You are setting mm. an example for them, and you are sending the message to them on whether or not you take this seriously, and this is important. And while maybe the, the the pressed uniform and the spit shine shoes aren't the important aspect of what we do as far as operational excellence goes but every little facet of that that you are that you are broadcasting out to the people who work for you who you are trying to lead and inspire every bit of that matters so there is that one moment where you need this this one airman to 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 take some order and you are in a difficult situation and the operation is going to fail somebody might get killed if we don't do this now that that guy needs to trust you in all things and that needs yeah. to know your judgment is impeccable i can't tell you how many talks i had with him about things that i thought were inane that didn't end like that and it woke me up to the difference even as a, a, a lieutenant and a captain that I could make just by little subtle changes in what I focused on and what I thought were important. And that has stayed with me to this day. I mean, that was, 
gosh, probably 35, almost 40 years ago. And to this day, I, in fact, I can still see John Pretz walking along with me somewhere or sitting in front of his desk at school because I asked him some really simple question only to find out that, oh, no, there's a real heavy component of this. Um, so that, that was huge for me. And, you know, that's that part of being a, uh, a young leader, I think, that is a difficult message to learn. And I was so fortunate to have such a powerful leader who was so comfortable talking about things like that when even mm -hmm. then it was becoming not cool to talk that way. Um, and and part of what I got from that is, wow, I thought those things, but I didn't know we could talk like that. Anymore. I didn't know anybody did talk like that. In fact, what I'm hearing or seeing from a lot of other leaders is that isn't the way we talk anymore. And this guy, who is so singularly impressive, almost always talks about that, about all things. I mean, talks like that about all things. That stuck with me. And it definitely uh, helped me when I got to NASA, not just be picked up, picked out to to run a lot of senior engineering projects at a very early time in my career. But I got selected to be one of the first space station flight directors uh, after six years at NASA, having never worked in mission control on console, which is practically, un well, practically, it only happened twice. And both of, the, both of the guys that happened to were deep in training astronauts and training people in mission control. And why did I get it? A large part of it was the leadership that I brought, that I learned, you know, mm. at the knee of John Pretz, my experience in the Air Force and all of that. In fact, I was told after I was selected, you know, your resume doesn't have a couple of things on it. We usually demand before we select somebody to be flight director and put them in charge of mission control. But we called, we called several of your Air Force references and the things they told us, we thought we'd be crazy not to select you. And none of that had anything to do with rocket science. It was all about leading the team and setting yep. the example. All things that I didn't realize how important they were while I was doing them. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I just created a, a video not too long ago talking about setting the standard within your organization. And I had one of those aha moments kind of with um, a battalion commander that was in uh, – a, a premier soft unit that kind of came down and graded our uh, company live fire, horrible live fire. It was really cold uh, at the end of the night. Everyone was really tired. It was like 12 o'clock at night. It was kind of raining and I was being very soft on the guys. And I remember that battalion commander walking up to me. He's like, Josh deeds, not words and just walked away. And ever since then, that's just stuck with me. Deeds, not words. And then I realized is that the standard in the organization is the bare minimum to be average that's what success looks like to show up. You, you, you're you meeting the standard. But as the leader, especially when you have the rule of mirrors, everyone's watching you. It, people who love you, people who hate you, people who are indifferent to you and looking for a chink in your armor, everyone is watching you. And that lesson that you learned at such a, a truly a blessing at such a young age, and you're able to carry on is that, hey, I don't, I wear this uniform with pride. Because when I need to make a tough decision, I know that soldier knows the standards that I hold myself to, and then they won't hesitate to act when, when that needs to come. Well, that's such a powerful lesson. You know, it's funny. Um, by the time I got – once I was selected to be a flight director, I, it didn't take long. I developed a reputation of being uh, – a nice way of saying it would be a fire breather. It's possible. Yeah. Some people thought I was a table pound and hard ass. <laughs> Everything <laughs> or, was a nail and you were the hammer. Or worse, right? Um, and, and that was my reputation from a lot of people on the outside. If you were to talk to the people who worked the teams with me, that would not be what you would hear from 90, 95% of them. Mm. Now, you know, you can't please everybody. There's always going to be some people that 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 are just going to be unhappy with, with being led. Uh, but the vast majority of them would not have said that. In fact, I, I have the dubious distinction. I don't not say this in public. I don't think I've ever said this except like one on one with people. But I I had the second highest uh, evaluations of flight director. And this is from the flight controllers, right? Not my bosses thought thought that, that I was great. But second highest evaluated flight director uh, according to the flight directors in in history. I'll wow. take that. Not that it was a popularity contest, but like most of their. Most of the grading wasn't on popularity. It was on how you ran the team, how you made decisions, yeah. that kind of thing. What was true, though, is that technical truth, integrity, courage thing. I was extraordinarily unforgiving on that 
because our mission was so important to me. I definitely had the, the mission control, that human spaceflight mission in my heart, that responsibility that we had to protect astronauts. I mean, I took that as a sacred responsibility. And anything that our team is doing that isn't based on making the right decision for the right reason, I felt like we're letting down our sacred responsibility can't happen, which meant if we had if I had a flight controller on my teams that was guessing on, on something, that guy and I would have a would have a conversation about it. Sometimes right then, if we had time, we, we would do it later. Um, you know, if, if, if I had somebody that 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 knew knew the action we should we should take and they didn't speak up until afterwards when we're, we're doing, say, an after action discussion or something like that. That usually would end in a in a relatively tough conversation. Uh, and, and when I say that, I don't mean I don't mean chest pointing and cussing, but I mean, hey, this is the expectation. And in and, and there is no there is no B performance here. Our, and we have to show up with our A game every single time. And again, if you were to talk to the people on my teams, uh, you know, I, I had nothing but but great support from them. From the outside looking in, I think there were some people that thought. Actually, a big criticism I would frequently get would be, wow, you sure do talk direct. And I would always ask, hey, when you say that, what do you mean? Did you hear me say something that was personally insulting or personally challenging or anything like that? Well, no. But, you know, it was clear you thought that that that, you know, the presenter, say, in a conference room didn't actually have the data to back up what they were saying. And they hadn't done a good job making their case. I said, well, did they have the data? Had they made a, 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 a had they done a good job at making their case? Well, no, but it just seemed like maybe you should have let that go. I said, mm. no, that isn't who we are. It's not what we do. I don't, I, I wouldn't emasculate a presenter. Hey, it's just, hey, this this isn't ready. We're not able to make this decision. Let's move on to the next topic. Here are the parts of your story that are weak. Go work on them and bring them back to us when you can answer this, this, and this. And if it happened more than once, you can guarantee I'm going to talk to that guy's supervisor, say, hey, What's happening near your shop? You're, you keep sending me work. You keep sending me fly, uh, engineers that that are doing work like this. We need better than that. And I guess that's direct. But you know what? I, I got a team performance, and I got a team performance out of a lot of people that that, like you said, at one time thought B team performance was good enough. I'm meeting the standard, but it's not good enough. It's not good enough for for any profession. In fact, you always want to show up with your A game. Even if the worst thing that can happen is we just lose a customer, we just lose some money. No, how is that good enough? You know, Elon Musk did not create SpaceX and Tesla and make them successful against all the odds by just trying to satisfy the minimum. Exactly. You just you basically just boiled down to the rawest elements of how to be successful as a leader within any type of organization. And it's one holding the standard. But it doesn't matter what your background is for, for you, like coming in from the Air Force and going in, being a, a flight director in charge of mission control. It doesn't matter. You didn't have that pedigree that they were looking for, but you had the ability to lead that they were craving and needing because you were able to lean on your team. You're able to lean on those people. I always call that as a leader, you're, you're like you're you're a foot. Uh, deep and a mile wide you maybe not you're not the subject matter expert but you understand all the tools at your disposal and your team are those wells they're a mile deep and a foot wide and that's where you tap and you direct and I always talk about like the symphony of destruction if you're a mega death fan I, I like to talk of like as a leader that that's really what you're doing is you're right. orchestrating the team to perform based on their strengths but you're also holding them accountable you're hu humble when you need to be and you have a servant heart that that is the that is the secret if there is any of being a, a a purposeful accountable leader or a transformational leader and you just summed it up i think absolutely I'll beautiful i'll tell you the thing i didn't realize during my time as a flight director you know as a flight director i, I was kind of growing into that leadership role and i was you know kind of kind of storming my way through one mission after another or solving one problem mm -hmm. after another with my team, you know, my focus was getting it done. And I mean, I was definitely focused on the leadership and leading the team the right way. It wasn't until later looking back, one of the things I realized that served me well as a leader was the fact that I did not let the discomfort of having to have the hard conversation keep mm. us from having it, right? Because again, it goes back to those ramifications I mentioned a few minutes ago. I knew the ramifications of the team being wrong, of me allowing 
the wrong action to be taken in orbit was too high. I, I don't understand discomfort in that environment. And I definitely learned that um, in the operations environment in the Air Force, you know, yeah. where you know, I have men and women around me bearing arms and we are we are doing satellite operations on top level national security systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this this seems uncomfortable. It sounds like I'm telling you that we aren't doing a good enough job or that you've made a mistake. And that's what I'm saying, because what we're doing, this whole thing can't tolerate that. And that not having that discomfort always came easy to me. And maybe it's something that I just learned over my time in the core at A&M and then my time in the Air Force. But by the time I became a flight director, I never let that discomfort get in the way. It did not ever become comfortable. I still mm. felt that discomfort. You know, I, even in my toughest moments, sitting down with somebody, whether it's a flight controller or a, an executive who worked for me when I was in the executive ranks and telling them, hey, I'm seeing these problems. I need you to step up. I, I, I don't want to see these things. That felt uncomfortable to me, too. I mean, for one yeah. thing, I loved my team at every level. Man, these people are family. And, and I, don't want, I don't feel good telling family, hey, you're letting us down. But I also know, and this was the beauty about the organization I, I lived in in Mission Control, they share my values. This isn't just me. It's the organizational values. The fact that, that I, they resonate so strongly with me didn't make them just mine. And so they knew by the time we get through this hard conversation, this isn't a personal attack. This is us trying to help us be better. In this case, maybe it's my job as the boss to help you be better. So I'm willing to put up with that discomfort, but I don't feel good with it either. And here's the thing, that person that I'm having that uncomfortable conversation with, here's how they can help me be the most comfortable. Hear me, get past me hurting your feelings. Think about, oh, okay, I see that. Here's where I can be better the next time I'm in that situation. And I will not, not for, for, for crummy old Paul Hill, but <laughs> for the cause, for what the team exists to do in the first place. And to set an example for their own teammates, for the people that are coming up behind them, who they are already starting to be in a leadership role for. That's what it's all about. And, and, you know, 95%, if not more of the time, anytime I ever had to have, I say a personal, this uh, uncomfortable conversation like that, that's how they responded. And, you know, what better feeling can you have to sit back and look at somebody that you, you had problems with and you weren't sure you could get that guy there and to see him take it to heart. And over the course of time, whatever that's, whether that's months or years, turn into a hero that you sit and you look back and you go, wow, I remember that time I thought that guy might not make it. And now, holy cow, I hope we end up all working for him. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the hardest things I think nowadays that leaders avoid. They, they avoid conflict. They avoid that 60 seconds of discomfort. And then that 60 seconds of discomfort grows into 60 hours of work that you have to do on the back end because you could have solved it right there. You could have potentially changed the course of that employee's life. And I, I have countless, countless stories of me having, having to have those tough conversations with individuals that I've even had to fire uh, some in Afghanistan and, and some as a company commander. Were, were they hard? Yeah. Were they hard every single time? Did they ever get easy? No, it, it, it didn't. But, at the core of it, I did it because I'm trying to make my organization better and I have to make tough decisions to ensure that the men and women that I lead have the best leadership possible. So when we do yeah, get called. I would, I would rather have that uncomfortable conversation than yeah. to look look some family family member in the eye and tell them, yeah, that was going to make me feel kind of icky inside to say that. Exactly. To those guys. So I let them make the mistake that cost you your mother or father or son or daughter. That, the heck with that. That's an easy to call to make. Yeah, And the hard part is to now translate that into other parts of the business because the same idea applies. Um, when I got into mission control management, one of the first things I was told was, hey, check all that leadership talk at the door. We don't really talk that <laughs> way. And by then, I, I was known to talk like that as a flight director. In fact, in some cases, the senior management kind of put up with me because I was successful as a flight director, even though I kind of talked the old way. And I got up there and my predecessor uh, as the director. So he actually brought me up there. And I was on staff and then I, then I was his deputy for, for a little over a year. Um, and he saw this before I did because he was for the, he was the first director they ever brought in that hadn't grown up in mission control. All the other guys incrementally over time had just the experience you just said, you know, 
that manager didn't have that 60 second conversation. That manager didn't have that 60 conversation, 60 second conversation. And over time, it eroded the culture. It eroded the culture so much that not only were these couple or three senior managers not having those conversations, it became wrong to do it in our senior management ranks. Boom. For, the, for the senior management team that leads mission yep. control by 2004 time frame, when my predecessor took uh, took the job, um, it was not cool to talk that way. When I got up there three years later to work with him, I was shocked when I saw that. And one of my proudest moments was a leader. I mean, as a leader was uh, just, a, a, I don't know, two years after that, less than two years after that, I replaced I replaced my boss as a director and he, he moved on to other jobs. And in that time frame, we took his concerns with that and then exploded them in the leadership team to pe pull apart what are we not doing well why aren't we saying these things and stop saying it's not cool to talk that way we're now going to teach ourselves how to actually say it right mm -hmm. and then we're going to push it down to the next level of the leadership team and they're going to push it down to the next and they're going to push it down to the next and while they're doing that i'm going to be giving talks to the entire organization at all levels over and over reinforcing what we have been preaching at them for years even though we stopped demonstrating it in the most senior ranks. And, and the biggest, my biggest fear for that always is it isn't just how you talk. It affects the culture. It affects how the people decide what is important and what they do. And God mm -hmm. help us if in any profession, what people decide is, going back to what you said a, a little while ago, adequate is good enough. Just hit, Just doing the minimum is good enough. Oh, no, it's not. That's how we go out of business or that's how we kill somebody. And how do you protect against that? Make it part of the culture. And not only that, make the culture aware that we have to talk about these things. We have to actually do these things deliberately. This is what it means to us. That's how you keep it alive. That's how you keep a management team from abrogating the responsibility and letting the organization fail when it didn't have to. Mm. You talked about right there something that's really near to my heart, and it's something that the past story that you just talked about with that major. But when when you let something slip like that, you just now created a new standard within your organization that people will replicate. So not having those, if you ever read the book by Kim Scott, Radical Candor, perfect example of how to have those tough conversations, but in a very powerful way. But when right. you avoid those tough conversations as a culture, then your organization avoids them. And then you're just sweeping rug, uh, sweeping problems on the, under the rug, or you're just kicking them down the the exactly what our politicians do right now they just kick uh, problems down the road for someone else to deal with and then you start thinking short term well now i'm thinking uh, while i'm going to be in this leadership role i'm going to make decisions based on that versus thinking long term and seeing through you i need to make decisions that don't just necessarily impact my time here but impact many many years of the organization and the team that i'm going to be leading but i, I would love to kind of take it uh, now to what inspired you to write the book, uh, Mission Control Room to the Boardroom? You know, I, it would be the profound shock that I had when I got to the senior leadership ranks and heard people say it's not cool to talk this way. And not only that, to see that our management practices reflected that it's not cool to talk this way. And wow. that it, just as, as one of many examples, in fact, I go through, I go into these in the book, but I'll just give you one of them. Um, the organizations, so, you know, the, the mission control organization uh, had a number of different divisions, all different engineering disciplines and things like that. Lots of people. I mean, you know, when, when I when I started there, we had about thirty five hundred people. So pretty large organization, a lot of divisions. Each of the executives that managed each one of those divisions was expected when they came to the senior management meetings to not bring up any problems they were having, getting their part of the work done, including their part of the organization that actually comprise the mission control team getting ready for upcoming missions because mm. there was so much focus on being ready and flying on time that if they if we talked about issues in our management forums and we're talking mission control only management forums that if we make if we let it get out that we've got some technical issue that we don't know what to do with or that's getting away from us it's going to go over cost or we don't know how to fix it or we're not going to be ready for this next flight on time somebody's going to leak that and tell the upper management and then the bosses are going to get in trouble. And I'm not just saying it felt like this. They were told this 
Wow. So, and, and I quote, keep all of that shit to yourselves and go work out your problem for yourself. In fact, in that time frame, this is before my predecessor was up there. In that time frame, one of those division chiefs went to see the boss in the corner office. He says, okay, I know you don't want to hear, you don't like to hear the bad news, but here's the problem. My engineers are not going to be go to fly on time. There's a big part of, this was a major piece of the International Space Station with new command and control computers. This was a big deal. This would be like replacing two engines of a four engine airplane in flight while you're, while you're in the air. My guys are telling me we're not ready to do it. We know what the problem is. We just have not had the time to get all of the procedures ready and get the astronauts trained. We're going to need another three months. And the answer he got back is, why are you telling me this? If you can't solve your problems, what the hell do I need you for? Wow. I'll get somebody else to replace you, and you can go do something else after I fire you. That was the leadership environment of the, of the NASA Mission Control Organization. Wow. So why did I write my book? When we changed all of that, so like point by point, our management practices were exactly opposite of that, where I could sit at the head of the table as the no kidding boss, and we could be in a in a really tough engineering discussion where I'm part of it. And it's now clear what I think is the right answer. And one of the executives that worked for me in front of probably 30 people all the way down to our working level engineers. And one of, one of my direct reports would say, pause the dumbest thing I ever heard you say, look, we just got through seeing this data. Here's what the right answer is. And my response was, Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. I completely missed that. All right, go on, go on. I, I've, I've caught up with you now. There was no value whatsoever in them pretending the boss was right. And, they, and like everybody in the room just chuckled. Whereas if that had happened a few years before, people in the room would have been terrified. Oh, my God, that guy just lost his job for saying that to Paul Hill. I, I mean, not to me, because I wouldn't have fired somebody for that. <laughs> I, I'd give him a medal for telling me I was wrong, keeping me from being wrong. But that kind of thing, the, the, the fact that we did not make major decisions in the organization without every single one of the senior leaders being in the room. And more importantly, if, if we knew we had some senior, some senior or on the senior, but a major decision coming up, we would make sure we sent out everything we knew about it to all the divisions, have them evaluate it so that they could show up with here is we, we, we pulled the division of engineers at all levels. Here's what we think about it. Here's what we, here's how we think we need to change the decision and why. And we would then discuss it as a team including with many of their working level engineers in the room, sometimes stopping us and saying, no, 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 you guys got that part wrong. Here's what we think over here. Here's what we need to do and why. And in the end, the decision we, we made, we made as a team. And we didn't vote. It wasn't a democracy. I can't remember a single decision, however, when there wasn't, if not unanimous, near unanimous agreement. Yeah. on it. This is the rationale and we understand the data. And there was never a case where, we made a decision where this is flight safety related. Like we're going to accept this risk and it's either absolutely wrong to do or it's absolutely right to do. There was never one of those that we weren't all in complete agreement and the data supported what we had. And there was no fear. There was no discussion of we can't air this out in front of in front of anybody. In fact, I was I was known to have no go being ready to launch. Uh, a, a shuttle flight because we were not satisfied with our readiness on some some technical problem that we had been chasing on on the spacecraft. And my people knew, if nothing else, we can trust the boss to stand in front of the train and make sure that we don't do the wrong thing. Yeah. And you know, as a leader, what's my responsibility? That instill yep. that kind of trust, that kind of willingness, that 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 kind of culture. That the more senior you are the more that should be your, your full responsibility because the people closer to the technical work, the people closer to the combat arms can manage all of that stuff extraordinarily well. If you give them that environment where they can now say and do right things and not be afraid of saying them or doing yeah. them. That's the whole theme that I've gotten through. And I love every individual episode. I, I, I begin to realize the theme and the theme that I've noticed repeated through, repeated throughout your journey is really evolve, revolving around candor, embracing that type of mindset, and then surrounding yourself with individuals that will tell you when you're wrong 
and then you being able to have the thick skin, like how we went back to that in the military, everyone says the thick skin or the humility to be a, yep, you're right. But embracing that type of culture with any type of organization that you've ever led, that's, that's what I'm, I'm seeing. And, and that's something that I share within my leadership practices that if we don't have thick skin, we can't move forward. And if we don't tell truths and facts, we can't solve problems. And then we have to bring everyone to the table because exactly what you just said, having that small group of engineers trying to work through this complex problem, well, that's just a small pool of your resources. Why aren't you bringing everyone together to try to solve this as a team? Because there's individuals' lives on the line. Yeah, if we don't make the mission, that's okay. But if we need more time or we need more resources, well, that's the failure of the leader. Instead of that individual being fired, the leader should be fired because they're right. not doing their jobs. What is one one resource or one practice from your book that you wrote that you could share with our listeners? <laughs> and you think I'd, I'd have one all keyed up, all queued up on my head since I wrote the darn book? When you, um, you know, for me, it was. The insistence that, uh, well, a couple of things, that the insistence that every decision we made had to include the whys. Like when you bring it to us, you know, we need to make this engineering change. We need this budget increase to fix this problem. Bring me, bring us the whys. Why is it in our best interest? How does this connect back to the mission? How does this make us better? How does it make it better for the team that's doing it? Don't just tell us this is a good idea or this is what you want, but tell us, tell us why. Let us have that conversation. And then as we as we make those decisions, take the, the decisions and the rationale, not just the decision, back down the chain so that mm. everybody right down to the working level understands this isn't just the direction. This is why we decided it. And, and if we got it wrong, then come back and tell us. And for me, it's keep everything about the mission. So, you, you know, you, you mentioned thick skin. I, I look at it a little bit differently. I think you have to you have to cultivate the idea that this isn't about personal insult. This is about our shared core purpose. Mm. You know, in our case, we exist to protect the astronauts, to get them to space and back alive, protect that, protect the spacecraft, and then and then accomplish the mission in that order. And and we will do everything possible to protect the astronauts' lives and bring and bring them back, in, including bend and break and destroy the spacecraft if that's what it takes. <clears throat> If we can rally around that, then discussions that in other organizations might feel hurtful, like you're picking on me and now I have to have thick skin, don't really feel like that. Because now we all still have in mind, hey, this isn't about this isn't about attacking you. You know, your division, that your work isn't going to show up on time. Oof, let's talk about that. Let's find out why. Some other division, by the way, might have some resources, it might be smart guys, might be software, but we might have something that can help your guys. But let's talk about it and find out, is there something we can do to help? And why are we just finding out? What is it What is it in our management dialogue in the last several months that we missed? Have you been telling us and we haven't been hearing it? Have you not been telling us? If, if not, why not? Don't let that one happen again. But, but again, it's about that core purpose. It's not about finding out why you didn't lead well. It's are we sure that we were doing everything possible to deliver on the core purpose or on the mission? That is the only thing that matters. Now, you know, you don't have to, you can't use that as a, a shield to talk to the people that work for you any way you want. Because, oh, hey, yeah. the hey, mission's all that matters, so I should be able to, to, to talk in, in, in the most offensive way to you. No, nope, that's not the message at all. But in fact, I'll say it even more concisely. We learn to err. I mean, we learn uh, in, as a management team to err on the side of clarity instead of diplomacy. And if I could mm -hmm. sum up the biggest change we made in the mission control management range, besides making it cool to talk this way, it's we changed from diplomacy over clarity because that way there weren't any ripples in the pond. In fact, that's that's what the old guys used to say. Don't 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 make any ripples in the pond because we don't want anybody to find out about it. And what we learned to say is, no, 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 we, we prefer clarity over diplomacy. And if somebody gets their feelings hurt, we'll deal with that and we'll, we'll make amends. We'll fix that. I mean, try not to do that. But if that happens, we will deal with it. But we have to have clarity first, clarity over diplomacy, because you know what? The ripples are in the pond. We're just pretending they're not there. But if there's mm -hmm. some big issue that we're not working, the tidal waves coming, boys. So let's let's get them out, out, out all out on the table. 
you want to take the ripples out of the pond, tell us where they all are and we'll go fix them. We'll calm the waters. But I'd, I'd much rather do that. Error on the side of clarity instead of diplomacy. Don't, <laughs> don't be offensive, right? So, so you know, there, there's an art to that, but clarity instead of diplomacy. Because if you let diplomacy get in the way, then you're right back to, oh, I'm not going to have that difficult conversation and the culture pays the price. And then eventually your mission, your core purpose pays the price. And that's what we can't afford. Mm. Diplomacy over clarity versus clarity over diplomacy. I, I love that. Yeah, by the way, I realized I didn't, I, I got off the track, which as you can probably tell now, I tend to do because this is a, this is my favorite topic. Why did I write the book? Because as we learned to say these things and learned how badly we we were doing it, but how simple it is to actually do it the right way that had such a profound effect on me. I actually told all the, all the guys on my team, we're going to have to write this down. We're going to have to write, I, I got to write this book because I can't, you know, I mean, at this point we were 40 something, almost 50 years in, into mission controls history. And we're just now learning how to articulate these fundamental things and why they're important. I'm not yeah. going to be the director that, led the team that figured that out only to have us forget again. I've got to write it all down so that we don't lose it again. And, and by the way, the message is powerful. It's repeatable in any industry. So that's why I wrote the book. Cause I, I, I could not, you know, it was like this bug in my head, you know, like a, the earworm of the song. You can't ever stop yeah. hearing. It was that I couldn't get it out of my head. I had to write it. <laughs> yeah. I a hundred percent understand where you're coming from that that's one reason that i started this whole podcast is to try and communicate leaders who are starting out in their journey regardless of what their profession is that there is a better path out there to be successful as a leader and a lot of the mentors that you're going to have in your career and your life aren't going to show you those skills they're going to show you the toxic leadership traits that are going to get you success early in your career but it's not about success early in your career. It's about chasing significance. It's about improving the organization. It's about improving in people's lives that you're serving. And at the end of the day, it's about serving, serving others. And I, I would love to ask you, because I think you're a man of faith too, but how, how has faith helped you on your leadership journey? Um, I would say that the strongest part of this, um, it's funny, if you were to ask Gene Kranzis, he would give you a different answer than me. Gene Kranzis is <laughs> a famous Apollo astronaut. Um, I have an astronaut, a famous Apollo flight director, um, and among uh, and a lot of other things, including the guy that that kind of wrote the book on the original culture of mission control and the things that we used to say that became not cool to say anymore. He was the guy that first said them and wrote them down. Um, but my answer for this would be, you know, those moments when I thought, I don't, I don't know if I can carry this load anymore. I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to break me. I think, you know, the, the knees are bending. This is too hard. I'm afraid maybe I'm not going to be good enough. And it's that faith that no, no, I know I can. That, that there is, there is something, there is something else that is, that, that, that is, I'm not sure what the right way of saying this is. Uh, now we're getting into an area that I'm definitely less comfortable talking about, <laughs> which I'm not refusing to do. It's just, it's just, I have to, I have to think through my words. Um, th there is something else that, that, that has given me the strength to do this in the first place. And, and if, if I can just, um, if I can just keep reaching into that, uh, I can take that next step. I can take the the next step after that. In fact, it, it will help me then sit back and say, hey, you know, the friction we had in our last meeting, was that me? And if it was, I, I can rely on that same sense that there is something else that is giving me the energy to do this in the first place that does actually push me back to then have that conversation. And, and you know, if the, if the problem we had on the team was me, I'm going to be the first one to tell the team. In fact, I'll get the team together and I'll tell all of them in front, in front of everybody and tell them how I'm not going to do that. For me, it all ties back to those same things. And that this isn't, this isn't just about me. There is, there is something else that we are all connected to yep. uh, that if, if we don't lose that will help us on those, in those darkest moments where, where we think we can't take that next step. Yeah. And uh, I, that is one of the most, I think, impactful things is that there's always light, even in the darkest of moments. And I can tell you is like some of the most darkest moments that I have in my life. The individuals that were around me helped me get through that because they helped show that there's light 
there, regardless of the environment that we find ourselves in, regardless of the problem that we find ourselves in, there's always light, but you have to have that mindset to look for or hunt the good stuff because there's always enough bad stuff around us. And then if you start getting into that mindset and thinking, well, I did that wrong. Well, I should have said that, or I should have said this, or I should have done that. Well, then you're just creating that type of negative reinforcing behaviors. You have to start thinking about, okay, what could I have done better next time? I'm going to go do that. And I'm going to have the strength to go. do it. Um, I will tell you, I I was obsessive about that. It's possible. I'm kind of obsessive about looking back at how we could have been better, how I could have been better to the extent that when I was training to be a flight director, or actually when I was working as a flight director, and I would get these evaluations from the flight controllers, kind of like a, like report cards. Except this is yeah. report cards from the team up to the leader, and they were they were anonymous from the flight controllers. Um, and you know, I'd read through the comments, I'd read through them, and even when the scores were like like flaming high, I would take the lowest ones and I wrote them on the whiteboard in my office, and I would write the comments that I thought they were the ones that kind of hurt the most. Yep. Right. And they hurt the most because I read it and I go, yeah, I own that one. That's me. And I yeah. would write, I would write those comments, and I would write those lowest scores in the in the areas that I was lowest in, and they stayed on my whiteboard until my next flight. And then I looked and I'd see it again, and I would look at them every day, with, with doing just what you said. How do I show up better and not keep doing that if that is getting in the way of the team? Mm. Which you can make yourself crazy if you do that the wrong way, as you said. It's got to be about how do I show up better, not gee. And I'm terrible. You know, I mean, one thing could be if you get really, really lousy scores. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm terrible, but I know I can be better and I'm gonna. And, and that's, that's, that's what tomorrow is all about. Yep. It's always about moving forward. Um, the past is the past. It's a fact. You can't change it. You can change tomorrow, but you right. have to have the mindset to move out to do that. I, w- I would love to kind of walk through really quick because i know we're getting towards the end of the show and i always try to end it at about an hour just respect of your time but where are you at currently on your leadership bridge and then what what pushes you every single day well you know i retired from nasa uh the end of 2015 wrote the wrote my book um (laughs) interestingly the the nasa lawyers originally told me i was allowed to write the book while i was a nasa employee and then I got a visit from uh, one of the most senior lawyers, hat in hand, uh, almost literally. He says, yeah, OK, our, our, we screwed up. We shouldn't have told you that. That federal statute says that for you to write this book, you, you're, you'll you have to retire or you, you can't be a NASA or a federal employee and write mm. this book. That, that leans so heavily on my federal employee experience. I mean, it wasn't that NASA was going to be mad at me, but that apparently it's against federal statute. <laughs> oh, wow. So, that kind of accelerated my thinking. I was at that point, I was ready for a change. Just other things that were going on in NASA. I had led MOD to a place where I felt really good about where we were. Um, and so I, and so it was, it was not hard for me to, to move on to do other things. So I wrote the book and then I went on the speaker circuit to, to, you know, give you an idea where I am now. And what I learned when I started giving speeches about these topics, some of them based on my book, others just ideas that are tangentially related. Uh, as I did, I found that those ideas resonated in leadership team after leadership team and in conferences across any in, across any industries. And the more I did it, the better I became at it. And I, when I say better, I don't mean the, the, a better speaker, although I'm sure that happened, too. But, you know, it was sort of like the, the mission control team as we evolved how to articulate some of some of our m- most important cultural attributes as I talked about those and other things. I would have those aha moments. Oh, this is a better way of saying it. This is a clearer way of saying it that mm. more leaders will see how this applies and how to do this where they sit. So I've spent uh, the last seven years, I guess, from bet- between writing the book and giving speeches like this. Um, and, you know, if you were to ask me my most important leadership contribution, um, most people and NASA would assume that I would say it was my flight director time, especially because I was the lead flight director for the return to flight. So after the Columbia accident, I led the, I led the ops teams that developed a lot of the new things we had to put in place to be able to fly again. And then I, I led uh, the, the mission planning and, and mission control for the, that first shuttle flight after the accident. Most people would say, wow, Paul Hill would surely say that was his greatest leadership accomplishment. And it wasn't. 
it was leading the, the senior leaders in mission control to realize what we were doing wrong, figure out how to do it right and how to articulate it and why it mattered, and then push it down more than two levels, three levels deep into the organization. So I had I had mid-level managers now that were starting to become steeped into saying these things and connecting to why it mattered and how they and how they managed. Most, most that's probably my proudest moment as a senior leader. The seven years I've spent talking to management teams, though, I feel like I am making a similar contribution. You know, mm. putting ideas out there for managers in in other industries to pick up and apply. You know, my whole goal when I wrote the book was. You know, we learned a lot of our things the hard way, you know, the, the lesson of hard knocks, much like the military over the over the last couple of centuries. Not everybody needs to learn them the hard way. You know, in fact, here are the areas that we stumbled in and had to correct ourselves that we once did well. Here's how that happened. And here's how we got better again. Read our story and learn from it. Don't make the mistake. And you guys can be better than we were. And that's saying something because mission control is pretty damn good and always has been. That's I, I love that. So learn from someone else, a mentor, so you can avoid those mistakes. But I guarantee you there's going to be people that listen to this podcast that do not take that advice. And then they're going to do what Private McMillian did and having a drill sergeant yell at me is like, all right, McMillian, you're going to learn today. Pain or repetition, which one's it going to be? And th th that's just the story of life. Um, that's That's hilarious. And I've learned that. And now I've humbled myself enough to go out find people that are successful in areas that I want to be successful in and pick their brain, take them out to lunch, add value to them and learn from them because they've lived that experience and experience breeds wisdom. And that's one thing that you can't have unless you go through a situation or if you have someone in your corner who has that type of experience. You have to be careful though. I agree with you. You have to be careful because experience often also breeds arrogance mm. and, and, and it's it's an it's a well-founded arrogance right it comes with the confidence of knowing that i'm an expert and i'm good but it's easy to lose uh some of the edge that actually made you good because well you just you just know that Love you're that. good and so you, and in fact it's it's the rare leader who stays self-aware long enough because you know the the hazard of being a leader is especially a leader that's really well respected is everybody's telling you how good you are. In fact, yeah. some people may be telling you that you're always right. And boy, you got to be on your guard. You got to put your shields up to not let that stuff penetrate too much or you start mm -hmm. believing it. And now you're not listening to your team anymore because you don't need them. I, I actually had one of the most respected engineers and leaders that, that was at NASA my entire career actually told me once when he was really in his heyday, you know, the guys that work for me, I really don't, my biggest fear is that they make decisions. I don't want them to make any decisions. I want them to bring all the data up to me mm. and let me make all the decisions so I can make sure the, the right thing happens, which, I mean, you know, for me as a leader, it'd be terrifying. Now, yeah. what I agree with, and it was only this was only part of his meaning, by the way. He actually meant that the way you would, you would take that at first. Part of the meaning I agree with is, hey, if we're making engineering decisions down and in the ranks that really have life and death, life and death ramifications, and these are changes to the way we've evaluated those risks before that needs to bubble up and we need to hear that at higher levels it doesn't have to come to me because i'm going to second guess your engineering but i'm going to want to know we are now recommending this change in engineering that is different than we've always done before and and it has this life and death effect where it could cause this major system on the vehicle to fail mm. i need that i need it to come all the way up and by the way it's not just for me it's for it's for all of those senior executives that work for me. I want the senior leadership team to hear that so that we can all make sure, hey, are we all in agreement? Are we missing something? Is there something else we ought to ask before we do that? And are there engineers or working troops down and in any other part of the organization that when they hear that, they, they, don't, they raise their hand and say, wait, 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 that sounds wrong. So from that regard, I agree. I still want them to make the decision. Some of those things we have to know at all levels these decisions need to go up and be reviewed at a higher level to make sure that there's not something we're missing, but that's not me making the decision. I love that. that no, it did. And I think it kind of goes back to the whole idea is that big decisions require big teams and you don't make them in solos, especially if it's going to affect someone's life. You don't want a silo of an engineer just making a decision that has a consequence of potentially impacting 
the success of a mission or success of a life by themselves. You want it to be flushed out and you want all the facts to be laid out at the table. But so we're at the end of the, the podcast and I call it the killer bees. It's the same four questions that I ask every one of the guests that tells the leadership podcast. So it's be brief, be brilliant, be present and be gone. If you're ready, we'll start with question one. Sure. So what do you believe separates a good leader from an extraordinary leader? The, the willingness to be humble enough to know they don't know everything uh, and the willingness to keep asking their people to ask and answer those whys and to push that thinking down and to be open to the fact that any of us at any level might make might be making a mistake and that people below us can keep that from happening. Mm. Question two, what is one resource that you can recommend to our listeners? I would start with what got you here won't get you there, a book by Marshall Goldsmith. Um, it, that It's a real simple idea, but part of it addresses just what I'm talking about, that arrogance of success. And that is, this is what always got me here, but it may not help me at the next level. You know, that idea that you dance with the one that brung you? Yeah. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that means I'm really good at this level and it doesn't translate to the next level because the next level is where I need to have more of that cultural focus. And I can't stop being the chief engineer and second guessing everybody's math. What got you here won't get you there. Powerful book. Third question. If you could go back in time and give your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, boy, it would it, it would be to stop putting so much pressure on myself. Uh, that more people around me and watching me actually want me to succeed. I'm not at, uh, every day is not an opportunity for me to completely ruin my career, which mm. you know, I can't tell you how many days I felt like, oh my God, it's so imperative because there's bad behavior that goes with that. You know, yeah. you feel that impatience in meetings, you react badly to somebody because they're not agreeing with you. And oh my God, you know, relax. It's, it's not that bad. You, you have more time to work the issue with the team. Last question. How can our listeners find you and how can they add value to you? Oh, they can find me uh, probably the easiest ways on my website, which is atlasexec.com. So A-T-L-A-S-E-X-E-C.com. Um, and my contact information's out there. There's information about my book and you know, other things that I've spoken on. There's even a couple of little video clips out there. But there's definitely, definitely things out there associated with my idea. Uh, I mean, with my ideas. As far as adding value, um, well, two things. One, hey, if, if you read if you read my book or if you've heard me speak and you think there's something that I'm not clear on or something that I could say better or something that I'm missing altogether, send it to me. Go to my mm -hmm. website. My email address is on there. Send it to me. Let me know. I'd, I'd love to hear it. Um, but the other one would be I need a literary agent for the novel that I wrote during COVID. So if anybody that hears this is a literary agent willing to listen to and willing to read my, my manuscript, let me know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I hope so. Not afraid to ask. Podcast world can do that. <laughs> Paul, it's been humbling to go through your leadership journey, starting off in the Air Force and moving to NASA. A, a truly a depth and breadth of leadership experience that I don't have on the show very often, and it was well worth the wait. So I'm glad to have you on, and I'm really excited for this podcast to air because it's going to impact some lives. You dropped some very very impactful leadership knowledge on this oh thanks a lot i i can't thank you enough for inviting me i've, re I've really enjoyed the, the conversation joshua so it's been my pleasure absolutely hey have a great memorial day weekend brother thanks sir you too